I'm going to give you a very brief introduction. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is June 4, year 2023. It is 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. This is Professor Hamamoto. And I have a very special guest for you today. <laughs> I wanted to keep it kind of on the down low because I've been having problems with two of you. Um, and uh, I didn't want to tempt fate. So I just thought we'd surprise them here. Um, but her name is uh, Ms. Leslie Elliott, and she has an incredible story or series of stories, interconnected stories to tell about her professional life. And um, first off, I think um, while we're having this conversation, uh, subscribe to her channel. It is called uh, The Radical Center, and she also has an excellent website. And from what I understand, we'll get clarification if necessary. She's uh, currently, she's a very, very popular uh, life coach. Her, her channel's excellent, YouTube channel. That's how I found her. And uh, it's, again, it's called The Radical Center. And uh, we, in watching her show, I found out we had something in common. That is the notorious Sue family, S-U-E, which we're going to, there's going to be some academic professional gossip here. All right. I'm going to give you a, a, a warning, right? It's not going to be totally, we're going to have some fun with this um, because I think that's really one of the uh, approaches that um, are going to deflate the little balloon, their little bubble they're in. So with no further ado, let me bring her on. This is Ms. Leslie Elliott. Hi, Ms. Elliott. Hi. Welcome to the Professor Hamamoto channel, but please call me Daryl if I, can, if I may call you Leslie. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daryl. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. It's great. Now, uh, your channel is currently up to, what, 11,000 subscriptions? I'm talking about YouTube. Yeah, I think so. I think that's about right. Okay. And uh, it seems like your network of people who are like-minded, let's say, and mostly they're fellow professionals such as yourself, uh, it seems to be growing. It's, do you, and that leads to my first question, are you seeing a ground swell of a, sort of a counter reaction against what you experience personally, professionally? And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, yes, indeed I am. And I think it's been really, it's given me a lot of optimism for where we are because there are so many good people who are very serious about their opposition to what we've been seeing. Okay. And so on that note, I don't have much personal information on you other than you're a mother of four mm -hmm. and you're originally from South, South Texas mm -hmm. and you were a minority person in your own community. I don't know how South, are you talking about South Padre Island or? Oh, South Central Texas. I'm from South. San Antonio. Yeah. Oh, San Antonio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beautiful San Antonio. Wonderful. Okay. So let me ask you, how did you uh, migrate from San Antonio over to Antioch College. What was the process there? Oh gosh, the trajectory. I So I moved to Seattle in 2019 to go to law school at Seattle University School of Law. And I decided that a career in law was not for me. And I, I, I'd done an undergraduate degree in psychology and really had thought hard about going into academia or into counseling. I, um, I had an undergraduate research fellowship and worked on some, some research in psychology at the time, and I was really torn about what path to take. And so about midway through law school, I decided that I really did want to go back into, um, into the field of psychology to, in, to some extent. And it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. I had two more children in the meantime, took a little break from, from school, had two more kids, and then I decided to go to a clinical mental health counseling program in 2019. 2019, so it's, we're going on around four years so far? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, at this point, Antioch University, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was a university in Seattle, and so I looked at a couple of different local schools, and I thought the program seemed pretty solid and um, started in the spring of 2019. Okay. Now let's get into some of the hurdles that you, um, you were met with uh, when you, when you entered into this program and I don't know what your status is yet. And so if, if, if it's going to endanger your relationship with the, 
the, the professors or the staff there just, you know, you can demur on any of these questions. But uh, first of all, what were your expectations in going to uh, Antioch University in Seattle? Well, I guess my expectations were based on previous psychology study that I had done when I was in a, um, a clinical psychology program for my, my undergraduate degree. Um, I had had the opportunity to take some graduate classes for undergrad credit at the time. Um, and I found all of my classes to be very strong and my foundation in basic, um, the, the history of the profession was very strong. And so I really expected my graduate study at Antioch to carry on with that and just to get a little bit more in depth. And I was really surprised by how much the social justice ideology has supplanted classical um, psychology teachings, at least in that program. And, and from what I'm hearing, a, kind of across the board at this point, we're seeing it in, in many, many programs. So this is 2019 and we're in the full flower of right now. Your timing couldn't be more perfect. Yeah. Um, so how did you grapple with your expectations versus the reality of political correctness? Oh know? gosh, it was yeah. really, um, it was such a surprise to me. I, uh, I, right off the bat, I guess I didn't really know what I was experiencing. I knew that it seemed unhealthy, for instance, to be asked to announce your pronouns in this context. I thought this was really strange. Uh, fostering this kind of sense of one's self-concept being outside of oneself and the responsibility of someone else to reflect back to you seemed, uh, it seemed patently unhealthy, but it, but it was my first time really dealing with this or experiencing this. So uh, I, I kind of, it took me some time to sort of understand why I, I had uh, concerns about this. And then the next thing was the race stuff that started in my second quarter. We really started hearing a lot about um, white fragility, uh, privilege, and then the idea that people based on their racial background have had different identity formation processes. And this, it, it, it was so reductive and simplistic and flew in the face of everything I'd been taught before, even just in basic social education and life, but, but especially within the field of psychology and social psychology. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in your amongst your peers in your entering class, were you talking to them about this, or did you keep it to yourself, your reservations? Um, I think I, I, well, as I started to have issues with it, it wasn't so much that I was talking about it with my peers, but I would speak up to the professors in class and ask questions about why this was being taught this way, and so I would, I really was the only person in, uh, in the, the class where this really became a, a very salient issue was a second quarter required course called Multicultural uh, Perspectives. And so this course was just basically a, a social justice DEI training class disguised as a college course. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, a, it was a core class in the program and it was a cornerstone of what we were supposed to be picking up from Antioch. So um, I really was the only voice of dissent in that class. And so other students thanked me outside of class or sent me emails thanking me for some things I'd said, but people were very hush-hush about it and really didn't want to address it head on, even in those emails and thank yous. It was very vague and oblique. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is this a two-year program? Is it a master's course? It's or a three-year, yeah, three-year master's. Three years, mm -hmm. okay. I guess you possibly could do it in two, but it would be hard to do. Okay, mm -hmm. and that includes an internship or clinical experience, mm -hmm. I assume? Mm -hmm. And this qualifies you for the, is that the MFCC, Master of Family and Counseling? It's, uh, it's a CMHC program. They do have an, it's a clinical mental health counseling, so they do also have a family, a couples and family track, but I was in the individual therapy okay. program. Yeah. All right. And the idea was to go either to, into academia teaching or to start your own practice or perhaps a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Mostly okay. um, to start your own practice or work within a, within a mental health setting. Yeah. Okay. If I uh, understood you correctly, you raised this question right in the class 
and you directed it to the professor and the students were there. Is that listening to this? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it would, frequently. I mean, I just, I would ask clarifying questions because so much of the information just seemed, um, it seemed of a low intellectual caliber. It just seemed un anti-psychological. It was just a really, it felt like uh, a, I, I don't know how to describe it except to say it was so simplistic. It was on a, hmm. I, I felt like I was in a seminar for eighth graders. It was that low uh, level childish. Yeah. So it wasn't so much psychology it was just uh, some professor venting or That's what it felt ideology. Like. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And it's a private institution. So I'm, I'm assuming that you're paying quite, quite a, a substantial amount for tuition. Quite a bit. And that was one thing I raised at one point, that it was really surprising that this was considered uh, graduate level work and that I would be paying so much tuition for this. And I was accused of being privileged and, use, and, and transactional in my approach to this program when I brought that up. I read that blog or I saw that one, yeah, and, mm -hmm. which raises, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like they were defensive from the very start. And mm -hmm. I think your questions were innocent and well-founded, but it seems like they were trying to gaslight you from very early on. Is that a correct characterization? Yes, yeah, that's very much how it felt. Yes, I was um, in this particular class, the social justice course, we were instructed to keep a journal, which was a dialogue between ourselves and the professor throughout the course of the quarter. And so I think I turned in something like nine of these entries. And these were supposed to be where we processed the information and responded to it in a written form and the professor would write back to us. And so uh, there was an assurance of confidentiality with these. It was to a higher degree than the other coursework, which could be, I guess, shared with other faculty members or transferred on if, if need be. But this was something that was supposed to be very private between us and the professor. And so I questioned aspects of the material in these and I was respectful about it. And I've, I've got a number of these on my Substack if anybody wants to look at them. And I've done a couple of videos where I've gone over them. So you can see the kind of tone that I took. I was trying to be very professional and academic with these. And um, the professor repeatedly told me that, my, that I should use my privilege and that I had been privileged and that there was this whiteness issue that kept coming up for me. And, uh, it, it was it was an attempt to not address what I was saying, but instead to brush it aside and and it felt like an ad hominem um, rhetorical fallacy. Now, what was the gender and the racial ethnic composition of your cohort coming in the first years? Mm, students? I would say primarily Caucasian, primarily female. There were some some males. There were some people from other um, ethnic backgrounds, but primarily mm -hmm. female Caucasian. And the faculty members that you encountered in your first two quarters, what was their profile, mm -hmm. if you will? <laughs> I would say mostly the same. I had one of my, my, uh, my first quarter, I had a, a, a female who was Caucasian um, and a male who was also Caucasian, and they were both very strong professors, really good. This my my introduction to the program was very good. I had two oh. great courses, mm -hmm. but my and I I actually I would say that I had a, a handful of really strong courses while I was in the program. So it wasn't all. It's the it, the thing that really struck me was the inconsistency, and the focus on the social justice stuff, which stood out in contrast to the quality of the of the um, the more evidence-based core curriculum, mm -hmm. but the school was increasingly pushing the social justice angle and it was bleeding into the courses more and more as I continued through the program. Okay. Yeah, it seems like uh, uh, foundationally the program was once good, solid, and then maybe 10 years ago or so they started to bring in the so-called what's now called critical race theory mm -hmm. and um, they grafted it onto the program that's what it seemed like yes yeah, a graft that's a really good way to put it 
Hmm. Okay. So, <laughs> but it's surprising that you're the only person that had any issues with it. Is were were the other people just sort of um, taken in by just saying, "Well, this is just the normative uh, way of doing it here," or what? What? What is it about you, Leslie Elliott, that made you say, "Hey, wait a minute, I don't really get it here." That's what is it about question. your background? I'm not really sure. I I think that. Um there were a couple of people who left the program in the first and my, in my first quarter, a couple of students who didn't explain what they had a problem with and, but dropped out. And um, these were, uh, I would say good students, really strong, intelligent people who would have been an asset to the program. And in retrospect, I wish I had kept in touch with them or kept their contact information so I could have followed up and asked if this was the thing that they had a problem with. I suspect it may have been, but I can't know that for sure. So I think that there were people who had a problem with it, chose to vote with their feet and leave the program. And then there were other people who seemed to have a problem with it because I was getting pats on the back from students in a in a sort of subtle um uh, you know, uh, behind the scenes kind of way, but people seem too intimidated to speak up. And I think that it is, it is very hard to go against mm -hmm. the, the group. So for me, I think that I was a little bit older than a lot of the other students. I was in my early forties when I started the program. Mm -hmm. A lot of the students, I would say average age was probably maybe early thirties late 20s, early 30s. There mm -hmm. were a couple of older students. There were some that were older than me, but um, I think age had something to do with it. I had not been previously introduced to this kind of thinking in an academic setting. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was easy to say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. And mm -hmm. I had a strong background in, in psychology education from mm -hmm. a very good program that I attended, as I said, in undergrad and had some graduate training as well. So I, um, I think mm -hmm. that it, the, the contrast really struck me. Yeah. And I, I also, as you mentioned at the outset, I did grow up as a racial minority, which is, you know, contrary to critical race theory, that does happen to, <laughs> to Caucasians as well in the U.S. And so um, a lot of the racial identity model that we were being asked to regurgitate just didn't fit my life. It didn't fit me at all. So it was easy to say, wait, that, no, I don't agree with that analysis. It's mm. not necessarily that simple. Now, where did you do your undergraduate work? And you took some grad courses too. Let's, let's recognize that undergraduate institution. Yeah, I went to St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Is this a um, Jesuit uh, yes, church-related? Mm -hmm. Jesuit. Mm -hmm. So they had not really, um, it seems like you, you kind of fell between the cracks between the old way of doing psychology, the tradition of the more standard, and then this sort of enforced orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And you were, you're raising kids to, you know, you had two children in the interim and then you walked into this bear trap mm -hmm. of a totally different academic universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you had not, you did not a touch, you know, with mm -hmm. it, I assume. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's well put. Okay, now the people that, because uh, it seems like your network of, of like minded uh, professionals mostly uh, that you have gathered around, how, how have you, uh, how did you get in contact with them? Did they reach out to you? I thought they were your fellow classmates or maybe disgruntled people from Antioch, Antioch University. Where did where did you find each other? Well, it's great. Yeah, it was really it was an amazing turning point for me, really. It was sometime in um, 20. I thought it was 2019, but it might have been as late as 2020. I was still trying to understand what was going on and how to articulate the, the sort of ideological influences that were so uh, so prevalent in this program. And I came across an article on the New Discourses website, James Lindsay's website, written by Dr. Val Thomas, who's a psychologist in the UK. Mm -hmm. And it so clearly articulated that what I was seeing and how damaging it was for the for the counseling profession. And mm -hmm. so I wrote to to Val, <clears throat> excuse me, and 
she was in the midst of setting up a new professional network for people who were concerned with this. And it's called Critical Therapy Antidote. It was brand new at the time, CTA. It's crit criticaltherapyantidote.org. Mm -hmm. And I, I got in contact with them and became a, a part of that network early on. There are a lot of really serious and, and wonderful concerned professionals that work together and, and network there and meet and um, both professionals and students in training still. So it's it was a wonderful resource and a really good reality check to mm -hmm. say, no, I really am experiencing this and other people are concerned about this as well. It really is um, what you think it is. So okay. it helped a lot. They were trying to gaslight you, but you realized that you were not crazy. They were. <laughs> What's her last name in Dr. or the Professor Val? Thomas. Thomas. O M A S. Mm -hmm. And I think it uh Lindsay, I think I'm I'm familiar with him. He's got a lot of really new content on YouTube recently. Is that right? Is that the same guy? Uh probably. He has he yeah. does a really good job of sort of breaking down the um the whole social justice agenda and and what it is and its origins. And so he's he's been really helpful in in for a lot of people learning to articulate what's happening. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this organization, critical theory antidote.com, that's a UK based, right? It's a, it's international. So oh international. Mm -hmm. Because what I am seeing also, because I watch, you know, the other related should not necessarily psychology, but I'm seeing that within the English speaking world, even in the UK or in Britain particularly, um, there are more people such as Val uh, Thomas and um, Lindsay and yourself mm -hmm. who are stepping up and they're creating and they're, they're, they're having a, a really positive reaction. So mm -hmm. I'm pleased by that. I'm, I'm encouraged by it. And that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you, mm -hmm. because uh, I would like my audience to subscribe to your work, find out about your evolution, mm -hmm. because... It's not just Antioch University. It's not just purely, as we know, academic, and it's not restricted psychology. It's a whole civilizational program. So where's that coming from? Uh, what are you gathering? I'm trying to figure out, what are, is it coming from outer space on a meteorite or what? It well, doesn't just appear out of nowhere. I think that there are probably people who are better able to address that than myself. I've, I, you know, I think we... It does seem like it is a concerted effort. It is. It does seem centralized. It's okay. It's being introduced and implemented seemingly everywhere at once, and you don't get that without some kind of centralized efforts. But yeah. I'm probably, you know, I've I've really focused on describing what it, it what it is that we are seeing and its potential implications for mm -hmm. specifically education and and therapy. Right. Um, and so I've I've spent more time addressing that end of it than really like where it, where we're getting this from. And I think that there's a lot of speculation to be done and some really smart people who are um, who are better qualified to address that than myself. But it is it is really concerning. Well, I think you're edging into it because um, uh, you sh must remember some of the names that kept on coming up again. These are like the anointed ones, mm -hmm. right? Who the people at Antioch or the, at the second tier, they, they name check them mm -hmm. or they cite their work. Mm -hmm. So who are some of the, the names, you know, with a capital N that, that kept on recurring in, in your curriculum? Well, the, the number one name that, well, I guess you had like Robin D'Angelo and you had um, Ibram X. Kendi. And these, these people were being so, uh, cited quite a bit in the multicultural curriculum. But mm -hmm. also uh, a really big one, and I'm, I'm glad you are familiar with this one, is Daryl Wing Sue. Mm. <laughs> he is someone who helped to develop the multicultural competencies for KCREP. And so for what, some of our accrediting organizations in American psychology and American counseling. And I, uh, the, the, he was the author of our textbook that we used for the multicultural um, perspectives course. And... I was really astounded by the low quality of the work. It just, it feels like a bunch of anecdotes. I mean, I, and I, I did a video on this book 
for my channel where I go over some of the vignettes that he offers as evidence for his theories on racial identity and racial mm -hmm. identity development. And if you go and look at these, I don't know how you can read these without coming away feeling like the author has made them up in order to suit his own narrative. And I, I know that's a strong accusation and I don't make that lightly. It really feels like fraudulent work, honestly. Mm -hmm. No, I remember that video uh, <laughs> and you make that <clears throat> accusation and I thought, wow, that's very brave, but I happen to agree uh, with Ms. Elliot on that. It sounds like at minimum it's a composite, but mostly it's just fabricated mm -hmm. to fit his little, well, I'll show you his little diagram. Mm -hmm. here's, here's one of them right here. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a little chart and um, I'll send it to you if you're interested, or, but um it's a schematic, you know, mm -hmm. as he, they call it, as you recall from your methodology course, a typology. Mm -hmm. Aren't they big in typologies and you know, definitions and words? So he's got all these little typologies and he's, he's big on r racial microaggressions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? That's his baby. And mm -hmm. I'll show you just so he's not a mystery person to people because I've been following the, and if you don't mind me, you know, taking a couple of minutes. I've been following the Sioux clan mm -hmm. for years. Yeah. So when you named, brought uh, Daryl Sue into it, I said, my gosh, I am blessed. Oh. Because I didn't think anybody knew the, these people's game. They're like the panda restaurants of Asian American psychology. There's, there's, there's multiple one. Do you have them down San Antonio? Um, panda, panda, yeah, we did. Seattle, yeah. Seattle. <laughs> Seattle. Yeah, the, yeah, they're everywhere, but it's the Sioux family is like they're one. like the panda. Okay, there's the tome. That's there's the book. By Daryl Wing Sue and David Sue. I guess that's his brother. And so I haven't done this research on the family, so I'm really interested in what you have to say about this. Well, remember the story about the five Chinese brothers? The fairy tale? I don't know if I know it. I think that they, they drop that out because it's too, you know, race racially insensitive <laughs> or something, but it's one of those fairy tales, you know, but but they, they're guys that came to life. That, to, to make a long story short, is that there's these five brothers. They're all named Sue. They come from the same family. And they're all PhDs in psychology. And each one of them is married to a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when I say they're like the panda restaurants of Asian American psychology, I'm not far <laughs> off. <laughs> I mean, they're probably sneaking in a lot of ideological MSG in there, though. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there's a whole story there. They're, they're dead. I'm going to tell some story out of class here, okay? Because <laughs> there, his brother, who's pictured here on the right, Stan Sue, that's another one. That's mm -hmm. Daryl Sue on the left. Right. I don't want to get into people's appearances, but it's kind of kind of bizarro for me you know what i mean but that's his 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 younger brother you know the junior sue was my department chair and he came in externally oh, okay. to monitor me and to take over our department and steer it in his direction mm -hmm. so okay. i fought him all the way in it because his whole deal was that asian americans were victims you know, we're, he called our, us the marginal men. We're on the margins. So, oh so I think along with the, the Chinese brothers and wives have crafted through, they're largely through private foundations and they're all corporate, Rockefeller, Carnegie, you know, mm -hmm. all the big ones. And he comes out of Columbia, which has a whole history of MF, not MS, MF, that stands for mind, you know what. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Re really corporate, um, military. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you heard of MK Ultra, right? Yeah. Um, they're the more uh, civilian version of that. And it's migrated down to Antioch University. And then your professors don't realize that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there is a genealogy of idea. And probably Daryl Sue and Stan Sue don't realize that mm -hmm. themselves. They're just hacks. Mm -hmm. They're just there at the walk, stirring up the uh, the mushu pork. You know, they they and they're just serving it up to whoever wants to to pay for the little happy meal, mm -hmm. overpriced happy meal. So here's your diploma, and here's your here's your uh, your five uh, ingredient dish, mm -hmm. um, and and that's not a a mischaracterization. This is basically what 
their franchise was. Their old man ran again. He was like old time Tong, you know, mm. like these little ethnic based organizations like a mafia. Okay. You know, Tong. Mm. This is up in Seattle area, actually. Mm. Okay. <laughs> but he ran a combination gambling house and, and a mm. whorehouse. Oh, That's wow. where those guys come from. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. So when I say we're going to do some some professional gossip, I just want <laughs> people to know the background of these characters so that when you see them in their giant ass book that costs 150 bucks, that it's a giant door stopper. And I do have a couple of his books. And uh, in fact, I'm not just making this stuff up. Right. I read his articles. Here's some if you care. <laughs> Oh no, I know. Uh, no, I've done the work. This book oh, was so. Uh, tell I, I me about it. I didn't keep a lot of the books from this program because, well, for one thing, like you you mentioned, it, book the books are so expensive, and a lot of times you end up renting them. And even to rent a textbook is sixty to a hundred dollars nowadays for these college yeah. classes. And so this one was one that I happened to have purchased. Um, I don't know why exactly, but. I could have sold it back, but I just wanted to keep it because I, I thought nobody would ever believe me how how bad this stuff really is. And it's not and it's not white fragility <laughs> saying that it's bad, which is what I was accused of when I offered criticisms of this book to my teacher. It's mm -hmm. it's just it's very poor workmanship. It's very unempirical and yeah. He offers racial identity development models for every different ethnic group that are just chock full of stereotypes. It's a zoology of people, and mm -hmm. it's it's patently offensive how how um, reductionist this stuff is yeah. when he talks about real people and how they develop. And there's just a way to be white. There's a way to be black. There's a way to be Asian, and and it's it's quite shocking. Right, and ostensibly, uh, him and his brothers, they got into this field so they could correct these little slights that they were growing up in Chinatown, in Seattle, mm -hmm. whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Someone called them a chink or whatever it is. Most of us grew up with these little taunts. I'm sure you experienced oh, them yeah. as a white girl in San Antonio, <laughs> you know, as a gabacha <laughs> or whatever they were calling you. Right? Do you remember, you know that term? Which gabacha. one? I was gabacha. called... Um, a weta and a uh, and honky quite a bit, but okay, yeah. I'm familiar with with yeah. that. Lot. I'm <laughs> trying to go with the Spanglish ones, but <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? You know, so I'm, I'm so, it's so great that you kept that book because I said, oh my god, that is the repository of about everything that's going on with the so-called CRT GLBTQ. It's in that book, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that textbook, that weighty textbook yeah, not cool. intellectually but <laughs> but uh, in terms of you know gross um, poundage mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so with this this showed up in your second year second quarter second, so second, pretty quick second okay. quarter mm -hmm. okay yep. continue please well, this, what did people say what the students say when they when they they found this book um you know i just didn't hear any real criticisms of it I didn't hear any real criticisms. People mostly just kept quiet and took this stuff in. And the professor sprinkled in discussions of this book along with YouTube videos showing white people acting clueless or being offensive and tried to talk a lot about the microaggressions. And she gave examples of, oh, she gave, for instance, she gave examples of, it was like a meme class. It was basically know your meme. So she she had a, a, an anecdote that was supposed to describe white saviorism. And this is a don't do this kind of thing. And then an anecdote that was supposed to describe using your privilege, which was virtually indis indistinguishable from mm -hmm. white saviorism. So there was so much contradictory information. And this book was just a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. So no, no intellectual substance. Did you ever get into like, quantitative empirical studies in, in the first year uh, pro seminars, let's call them like met theory and methodology, or is this all this anecdotal material? So, yes, I did have some courses like that. And some courses, as I said, were really good and really strong. The, the first introduction to the social justice stuff I really had was through this course where Sue's textbook was the, the main reading material. And then 
the the way that it progressed, I had courses where every course had a sort of, as you put it, a graft of the social justice stuff added on, where mm -hmm. in addition to the other aspects of the material that we were supposed to be addressing or, or describing, we were also supposed to address um, the intersectionality aspect. So that's mm -hmm. what they they used was something called the addressing model, which I think was made by someone named Hayes. I can't remember the first name of the, the person to credit this, mm -hmm. this awful model to, but um, <laughs> it's this, it's this uh, way of, of sort of assessing a person's identity via different uh, demographic characteristics, including age, disability, religion, uh, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, um, indigenous status, um, gender, stuff like that. So it's just, it's basically the way that you, and the way that you hear this operate is when you hear people uh, introduce themselves or, what, or read their introductions of themselves where they will say things like, I'm a white cisgendered neurodivergent queer, um, you know, first generation American, you know, they'll like list all these different or disabled or able-bodied or whatever they'll use, but they'll, they'll list out these demographics prior to talking about themselves in any more substantive way. And so this is the thing that we were being trained to do was to, to incorporate these, this intersectionality or this addressing model into our way of thinking about ourselves and our about our clients. And we're basically basically supposed to use this in order to evaluate ourselves and then evaluate the, the client with whom we're sitting in order to see who's got more relative privilege so that we would know how to interact with that client based on I'm an, I'm a, an oppressor talking with a marginalized person, vice versa, or we're both privileged people or were both marginalized people. So that was that, that was what we were taught in the multicultural course. And then we were taught to graft that on to every paper that we wrote throughout the whole program, even these papers where otherwise <clears throat> it was a pretty strong course. Otherwise uh, maybe it was a, an assessments course or um, a theories course, et cetera. So this was a graft that was added on, mm -hmm. but a lot of the courses were really still fairly strong otherwise. Mm. But as I, as I kept going to the, through this program uh, and in around 2020, it really ramped up the offerings for CMEs or, or continuing ed education um, and for workshops that students could take became more and more politically charged. And we were getting, messages from the Justice Leadership Council, which was a, a, a student and faculty hybrid um, organization within the school, inviting us to racially segregated groups. So there was an accountability group for white students and a, what was it called? An affinity group for what they call BIPOC students. So that was black and indigenous and people of color. Oh, I see. And so we were getting more and more of these kind of invitations to segregate ourselves and to think of ourselves in, in these terms. And it it infiltrated the curriculum in a clumsy way. I, I really, I, I know I keep saying it, but I'm so glad you used the word graft because it's just a perfect way to, to think about this. I've been trying to articulate it and that sums mm -hmm. it up so well because it does it felt like it it was this artificial construct that was supplementing otherwise valuable material mm -hmm. well i'm still trying to figure it out and you're helping me a lot here but still trying to figure out who's who's giving the marching orders at the mm -hmm. top is it the pentagon or is it nato mm -hmm. or is it the united nations is this like a uh, what is it? World Economic Forum type? Is this like a manifestation of the Klaus Schwab's Great Reset? Well, speculate if you like. You know, I I don't know who's who's pumping out the funding for the DEI and the critical race stuff. I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if it were those things. I mean, the the comprehensive sex ed stuff that we've seen come through this the K through twelve system is mm -hmm. being promoted and and um, and 
pushed by UNESCO and the WHO. And okay. so that's, that you can go straight to UNESCO's website and read their comprehensive sex ed uh, recommendations for, for schools. And then you can watch these things be rolled out in real time everywhere where you're seeing parents really upset about the sort of things that their kids are being taught in elementary mm -hmm. school classrooms. And so it does seem like it's coming from somewhere central. Mm -hmm. I looked through to try to see if I could find anything funny with the funding and see if I could tie it to anything. I haven't been able to, to, to discover what that is. I, I thought surely there must be something with the pandemic relief funding that, oh. that required some uh, additional DEI type materials to be yeah. forced on these programs, these schools that took the funding. The her funding, I believe, higher education. That was happening around 2020. You said, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. that that makes sense too. It would make sense to me if that were there. I haven't discovered it yet, uh, but I again, I haven't, I haven't really devoted a great deal of time to researching that. I've been focusing more on trying to talk with people about the fact that this really is happening and and mm -hmm. discuss. I, I guess where I was coming from with when I put out the first video on my YouTube channel was really, I come from a more traditionally liberal uh, perspective, more left wing orientation myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like there are a lot of people who are talking about this on the right or, and have been talking about it and warning about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a potential for a real pendulum swing and a backlash that I think attacks the wrong, the wrong players, because mm -hmm. this really has, it has the feel of a divide and conquer strategy. And, you know, we can really talk about where it comes from. Again, I would just be speculating because I haven't done the research to really give you that evidence, but I, we could both agree that it seems centralized. Yeah. Um, no, I do happen to agree. We're being whipsawed. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, yeah. I wouldn't disagree with that. I just, I'm just not the strongest person to talk about it. But, but what what the uh, the effect on the ground is is this just division? It's just pitting people against each other, and it gets people to fight and and distrust and mistrust and look at each other with with suspicion and hatred and resentment. And that's, I think that that's what's being born out of these ideologies, these race and gender ideologies that we're being fed with a fire hose right now. And <laughs> so my concern really is that as these things continue to be pumped into us, what we could see is a pendulum swing from the people who are being accused of privilege and, and marginalizing others to take out their uh, their resentment for these false accusations against the the people who are receiving the victimhood status, and I think that that's a misapplication of that of, of frustration. I think both sides, if you want to call them sides, need to come together, recognize each other as people, and recognize that this stuff doesn't make sense. It's this. I mean, here in the U.S., I mean, I'm a child of the '80s. This we were taught the opposite of this growing up. We knew that people were of value for their individuality and that you should not judge a person based on their race or on your your automatic suppositions about someone based on what you can observe physically through through meeting someone on this on the surface and that's fundamental we should understand that there's so much more to people than what you can observe based on immutable characteristics and we can't let ourselves forget that just because there's a new ideology afoot that wants to claim otherwise. Well, in listening to you break it down, Ms. Elliott, um, and it, it seems like you really do know, you might not have all the, the details, but I think you know that there's a hidden hand back there someplace. And I know that's not the primary function of your uh, channel. That's my job as a conspiracy there. <laughs> Sorry. But um, it sounds, it sounds, what you're describing, it sounds like a classic UNESCO operation, PSYOP. Mm -hmm. It's UNESCO, which was founded, as you know, by Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley. Oh, okay. Interesting. These were all the LSD. I'm sure mm -hmm. they're promoting, well, you know, you had a guest on the other night who's promoting DMT. 
Yeah, she you know? she's promoting ketamine therapy. Yeah, ketamine mm-hmm. therapy, but they're into microdosing psychedelics, and you know I've been through you know that that the '60s phase already, and they're doing that in Silicon Valley, mm-hmm. and they're bringing in very powerful uh, marijuana. I mean, you know, but but that was a re- excellent discussion mm-hmm. because you talked about your not so pleasant experience, personal experience with it, but you didn't negate her approach. Mm-hmm. Right, you kept it on that level. So I think, I think your your pedagogy, your you should be the one that is is teaching at Antioch University. Your pedagogy is non divisive. It's conciliatory, and it is intellectual exchange, like that's supposed to take place at the university. (laughs) Yeah, it's ironic. Of course, that's why they couldn't have you there. (laughs) I think it's really important that people should be able to have conversations that we don't we don't necessarily have to agree on everything. We can disagree and we can, and we can continue to seek understanding of one another. And it's not about getting everybody in line with your viewpoint. I, I think that that, that's a, that's an unrealistic expectation. And, and I think we can respect one another regardless of what, what our perspective is. And so mm-hmm. I think it's, I, I enjoy talking with people and I enjoy when they challenge me. And when they come from a different perspective than I than I do, and right. so it's I think it's it's all about being respectful and 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 listening. Mm-hmm. Now I want to ask you, and you don't have to answer this if if you don't want to, but were you personally put into like a mentally gifted minors program K through twelve or a gifted a gateway pro something? They have all these different mm-hmm. terms. Are you a product of one of those those programs where they they tab you and they groom you. Yeah, I actually was. I was. Um, oh. one of, I was one of three kids that was uh, that were selected and bused from my elementary school to another school for gifted s- programs. Um, and then I I stayed in the gifted program through through high school when I finally left it voluntarily. You checked yourself out at age eighteen. <laughs> I checked myself out when I was about sixteen, I guess. Oh, sixteen. I just, no. Yeah, I didn't. I I was. Uh, sort of frustrated with the program, but now, I was what, in the GT through then. From your perspective, what was what was the point of it, that, that these gifted programs? Because I think they need, these need to be looked at. This is a paper. This is a professional. Oh, this is a gosh. book. This is a monograph. But go ahead. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And I don't know. And I I, I could put my tinfoil hat on right there with you and, um, mm-hmm. and have conversations about it. I don't know. I, it was really interesting. Um, uh, they took like I said, elementary, I was just one of three kids starting when I was in third, um, second, maybe second grade. And uh, we, <laughs> three kids on this massive school, school bus being bused to another place where there were like two or three kids from all the different area schools brought in and just taught by one teacher. And it was a lot of like psychological puzzles and um, and different, different like brain teaser kind of things. And to me at the time, it just seemed like it offered something much more interesting than the rest of school, which was such a drudge that it was something I looked forward to every week. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I don't have a great deal of memory of what we did during that time. And I, I've wondered what, the, what that's for. What are those, what are they really trying to do? Was there a lot of testing going on? Was there a psychologist with a clipboard, observation, two-way mirrors? Mm, I don't know about that. If there were, I didn't Go into the regressive state and reconstruct (laughs) that for us. I think this is important. This is really important. Uh, I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know what the back end of that was like. We we had small groups and one teacher who was um, the same teacher for several years for the for the GT. Some very kind, sweet lady. It was very different from other classes. A lot of um, uh, a lot of testing. Yeah, lots of testing. So were they measuring creativity with these uh, creativity tests, not just rote memorization? Or- mm-hmm. Yep, yep, creativity. And uh, I, when I was in um, undergrad and taking um, some assessments courses and, and helping the graduate students as a subject for, um, for their assessments, I recognized a lot of what I've been put through in oh. in the uh, my childhood as IQ tests. It was just a lot, lots of uh, testing your different aptitudes and different abilities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
How about personality, Ted? I mean, I know that's generic, but there was the Minnesota multiphasic the test. MMPI, yeah. You're familiar with that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've taken that. On. I don't recall doing that as a kid, but I did that when I was an undergrad. Okay. Mm-hmm. Any other ones? It seems like uh, there's there's a disproportionate number of writers, editors, artists, and intellectuals who came. It's a grooming program. They want to see, uh, but they also want to see who's going to go along with the program. They want certain profile. But if if you're someone who tends to have a you know, defiance issue like yourself, you're asking questions, then you can't be part of the program. You know what I mean? Well, and I, uh, I did, that was one, that was probably, I don't know if this is of note here, but my MMPI score, I was really high in anti-authoritarianism. So. Oh, there you go. Yeah. It was like one so, of my biggest flags on that one. Well, you know, the OSS, which later became the CIA, they're famous that you can find this online. Uh, for free. Uh, it's called the assessment of men. They were into this stuff going into the, between the war periods, World War One and Two, because mm-hmm. they wanted to figure out who's going to be slotted and channeled in, this, in every which way. And I think every child is, is has, uh, especially with the so-called smartphones now, has it's already being tracked and traced and they're, they're giving their, even their emotional uh, data to mm-hmm. a centralized base and they can figure it out. Um. And I think that's really the reason for it's like, are you familiar with Operation Paperclip? A little bit. I don't, I probably, I've heard of it. And I, you could probably. They brought a lot of them down to South Texas. These were, these were Nazis. They were scientists Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who were brought in right after World War II to, to bring, to uh, work in the defense um, area, rockets, nuclear bombs, space travel, interdimensional, all the woo -woo stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's paper. But those guys are dead, right? They age out. So who's going to replenish them? Hmm. Little Leslie Elliott <laughs> was was earmarked. She, she was a dentist. She was tested, and she was put into the uh, circuit. Hmm. You know, I've actually wondered about that. About I've I've wondered in the past what those programs really were measuring and what the relationship to these government programs might be. I'll be glad to share with all the the uh, research reports and data that I have been collecting. Uh, do you know Philip K. Dick is the writer? Mm-hmm. The yeah, I mean, he's, they've made several movies from his writing. He was a product of it, and so was his wife, and they talked mm-hmm. in detail about it. And where he lived in Berkeley was the hotbed for all these emigre psychologists, mm-hmm. educational psychologists, and therapist people in San Francisco. That's why San Francisco is so freaky. Mm-hmm. And they were not Nazis. Most of them were Jews. Yeah. So there's the Jewish paper club. They don't talk. They talk about the sexy Nazis, but they don't talk about the MFers. You know, like mm-hmm. Jung was probably the only one that that was not Jewish, but they kind mm-hmm. of brought him in for that purpose. So, um, you know, if they want to talk about identity and object position, and they want to catalog that. That that's one demographic that's missing in that curriculum, not just at Antioch, but the university curriculum. It's a dark secret. Those mm-hmm. are the mind Nazis. Mm-hmm. That's why we're so screwed up in 2023. And the little children are helpless because they don't know where it's coming from. They mm-hmm. just think it's coming from 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 the internet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever that mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. So I would encourage you, and you have a a really good cohort that you're developing there. Just kind of, if you would trade information about if they, what they did as kids and in these little programs, Hmm. this could be a research project. You might be funded by the Carnegie Corporation. (laughs) Of course, they'll steal your research. Pardon me? It's very interesting. I'm I'm super intrigued. Well, this is, you know, part of the (laughs) exchange, you know, that supposed to be taking place amongst, you know, people who study the human human behavior mm-hmm. and society and culture, not this touchy feely stuff that, uh, or anecdotal uh, BS that's fabricated by Daryl Sue and Stan Sue and Dickie mm-hmm. Sue and, and Mary Sue and Peggy Sue, you know, all those people. Mm-hmm. It's BS, I'm telling you that, man. I, I came out of the University of California and, I, and that's why I call it pseudo psychology. 
there is a real psychology and mm -hmm. that's what you went in there it sounds like to study mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you found the pseudo mm -hmm. they, they they did a bait and switch on you <laughs> yeah that's exactly what the, that's exactly what it felt like yes okay well let, let me uh continue then I, wa I want you to have the last words here we're almost up on the 60 minute mark what other startling revelations did you have in the, and I assume you dropped out of the program or left it. There was a separation from um, Antioch. So uh, as I went through the program, I, I kept having reservations about continuing because the, the rhetoric was, was thickening and intensi intensifying. And I was very uncomfortable being a part of something that I felt was, uh, was promoting something that, that I, I think is unhealthy rather than something that I think is positive. It was putting me through something that I felt was personally unhealthy, but it was also creating a, a whole cohort of clinicians who were going to go forward. And if they took their charge from Antioch seriously, they would be working not as supporters of the individual clients that they work with, but rather as activists and agents of social change for social justice ideology. Right. And so as I was going forward, I, I continued to be uncomfortable. And so I sort of slowly, one, one class at a time, sometimes two classes in a, in a quarter, uh, trying to decide, have I, do I want to throw good money after bad and keep getting this degree or do I want to pull out a bit? But I, um, a couple of things sort of happened at once that, um, and I don't, I could, I could talk about this a long time, but I don't want to take a lot of your time. So I'll just yeah. talk about take, the most take your time. Of it. Take as much time as you need. So um, I, uh, one of my required core courses was a trauma, grief, and loss class. And so it, the first time I tried to take this course, the first assignment was go in and sign this civility pledge and sign it publicly, make a public declaration that you agree to it. So I went and looked at the civility pledge and what it was, was a pledge to social justice ideology. It was um, pledging to um, basically look for racism, sexism, ableism, um, like, like heteronormativity and stuff like that. And to examine our, my privileged and marginalized identities. And I didn't like this framework at all. I didn't agree with it. And I, I didn't want to sign it. But I also knew that if I posted publicly that I didn't agree with it, that would be a really uncomfortable experience and I might be targeted. And, and um, I, so I dropped the course. And then I, I spoke with my faculty advisor about it because I was concerned about the increasing social justice rhetoric in the, in the program. And she said, we are aware that we're no longer training clinicians who are going to be able to work with the Trump supporter. And that was what she said. Ooh, wow. And I found that really shocking, not because I was a Trump fan, but because I, that's 50% of the American population who now we have a, 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 an accredited applied psychology program training counselors that they are openly stating will not be able to work with half the U S population because they're going to, demonize them from an ideological perspective. And I found that to be so unethical and concerning. A, a little bit after that, and while I'm still trying to make up my mind as to how I'm supposed to proceed, how I can proceed, and have I sunk so much money and time into this program that it just makes sense to continue going forward, I started to receive communications where they changed the, the word um, woman they're promoting alternative language to replace the word woman with, with, I'm sorry, this sounds so vulgar. I have a hard time even saying it, but uh, AFAB, so assigned female at birth, AFAB, people with vulvas. Oh, yeah. The word that. woman. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be so dehumanizing and, it, and, and just an ugly way to, I mean, how have we come to a place where in, in you know, 2022 at the time, we're going to refer to people by their genitals? It's just so disgusting to me. And um, I know that's a little bit of editorializing, but it really bothered me. There was also promotion of language around the trans child at this time. And, mm. and I felt like everything was really pushing in a direction that was uh, so extreme that mm. I could no longer support the program and, with my patronage. So I made a video uh, basically saying these things, uh, telling my concerns. It's just an eight-minute video. 
and it went pretty viral. So a lot of people saw it, including Antioch, who saw the video, which was fine with me. But their response to me was to call me a white supremacist and to set up a crisis team in the school, tell people to absolutely not watch my video because it would give power to my voice, but informed them, first of all, instructed them not to watch my video, but then informed them that my video was full of white supremacist and transphobic ideology, which it wasn't. Um, and so at that point, I, um, I, have not, I have not been expelled from the program. They changed my student status and, and changed the, my access to emails and, and my coursework, my prior coursework. So my student account is very limited. I have been communicating with them through an attorney. I have um, been, I won't sign up for any more classes unless they issue a full apology. I'm very close to the end of the program and I, I, mm. I, I'm still unsure. If they issued a full apology, it might be worth it for me just to finish and get the master's degree. But again, it might not. So it's, it's a very difficult ethical dilemma for me. Can I ask her how many course, how many credits do you need? I don't remember. I'd have to take a look, but it's okay. uh, it's not you, that many. Would they be amenable to having a uh, supervised external tutorial independent study? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. Ask them because I'll, I'll do one. Oh, wow. Or more. Huh. In, independent study. It's all on you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. I'll read your paper and I'll mark it and give. So <laughs> that might be a way for them to save face and allow you to move forward. And I'm, believe me, I'm not going to give you any grief. I've got better things to do in my life. <laughs> well, I have been. Um, I have been. That's in a proposal talks. there. Go ahead. No. Run with it. Yeah, I've been in settlement talks with them. So I, I don't know what that's going to look like. I've asked for my tuition okay. back. I'd like my tuition back for the program. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But any type of leverage that you have going into the negotiations is going to, you know, work in your favor. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's that's a. A possibility independent study if, if it's just like a matter of a course or two then we say yeah sure yeah because then they'll be free of you too as well that's <laughs> I'm sure all they like of. that i'm sure they would huh? like that yeah yeah they might eat it up so anyway that's just just uh something for you to you know think about you and your attorney too to think about as far as a negotiating tactic so yeah so that's where you're standing now that's kind of rounds out the um the the, the storyline the timeline of, of your your work with antioch so in the meantime you're working as a life coach like yes. what what is your means of making a, a living because you're not no. um uh, certified yet right you're not, no i've you know. chosen to forego certification and i i opened a um a coaching practice just um offering supportive conversation um person-centered and uh, more philosophical peer support. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's been going very well. I started that about a year and a half ago, a little bit more than a year and a half ago. And it's gone very well. I feel um, I feel like it's there were there were other things as well that I was concerned with about the the counseling profession and the way things are going. I think that there's I have concerns around the increasing medicalization of of the counseling profession. And even prior to my leaving Antioch, I had determined that I would not be seeking licensure as a therapist. I don't want to work as a clinical licensed therapist at any point in my career. So I really do prefer the flexibility of the coaching model. I don't love the word coach very much, but mm -hmm. it does, it feels different than, I don't feel like I'm doing something that to me makes sense in terms of coaching. I feel like it's more like supportive, um, mm -hmm. A supportive conversation and 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 philosophical exploration. Mm -hmm. So, for for those of you who are watching this video, the people who are watching, how can they contact you if if they're interested in your professional services as, as a uh, consultant? Mm -hmm. I won't say coach. I just took that off your website. Yeah, no, um, I have, I have my. Because you're more than that, you know. <laughs> the website is the Radical Center Consulting dot com and uh okay. you can contact me through that right now i am pretty full and i have a, a wait list and and uh but that moves sometimes that moves rapidly sometimes not so but i am uh, you can contact me there and i have a list of resources also that i can send out and some good referral opportunities for people who are looking for similar 
non-ideological support mm -hmm. in their lives. And I, I get a lot of inquiries because people are concerned with what's going on in the therapy field right now. Right. And uh, other platforms, are you on Rumble? Are you on Patreon? I am on Patreon and I am on Twitter. But I, I haven't started a rumble yet. I probably should do that just to back up the YouTube channel at some point. Yeah. So for for your patron you or patron, you are uh, the Radical Center or, or is it Leslie Elliott? It's the patron. Radical Center. Yeah. Oh, the Radical Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to support her. And then uh, one more yeah. thing. Yes, please. Um, uh, some colleagues and I started a peer support community called Solid Ground. And you can find us at solidgroundsupport.com. The com or org? I'll have to check on that and I'll get that to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's com, solidgroundsupport.com. And it is a, a great way to connect with other people who have been impacted by social justice ideologies and, and authoritarian COVID uh, mandates. So uh, we just, we have a wonderful group of people who come together and talk. It's, we have <coughs> weekly meetings, four weekly meetings right now. And um, We'll add more as we need to, but it's a it's a good way to connect because I think sometimes the isolation can be one of the hardest things about mm -hmm. feeling and, like. And once more, what's the name of that group? Slowly. Solid ground, and the website is solidgroundsupport.com. Okay, solid ground. All right, we got mm -hmm. it. Any other uh, contact information? This is this is a wonderfully um, rendered account of your struggles, both personal and professional. I hope lots of people watch this and will. Um, avail themselves of your services and uh, as well as watching your your incredible uh conversations with your peers and just um and like i said i think the, the importance of it ranges widely and i think it's going to make it i'm just predicting it's going to make a huge impact far beyond antioch university that's going to be something in the rearview mirror <laughs> you know what i mean it, it's big now but it's going to recede into the distance. That's that's my uh, assistance. But I wish you well, you and your colleagues. Uh, Godspeed and um, keep at it. If I can uh, help in, in any fashion, please reach out to me. All right. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Elliott. Thank so you much. so much. Mm -hmm. Good luck to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye.